Get ready for a groundbreaking program. We have your handy dandy guide to Tuesday's election. We track a rocky couple of weeks for the new Kansas governor. And if all this news has you looking for a stiff drink, we have you covered on that too. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marley Scorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. It's good to be back. Welcome, everyone. I'm Nick Haynes. Thanks for sticking with us. And we're going to make it worth your while with even more pithy insights and penetrating analysis than you thought was even humanly possible. It's all going down right now. She's been busy having coffee with all the Kansas City mayoral candidates to give you a fuller portrait of these men and women. 41 Action News reporter Kat Reed also sharing that caffeine fix on that assignment. Her 41 Action News colleague Stephen Dial. From the Call newspaper, Eric Wesson is with us and political analyst columnist and Kansas City Star editorial writer Dave Helling. It always seems so far away. Now it's decision time. This Tuesday is the citywide primary election for Kansas City Mayor. Last week, we brought you an hour-long debate between the candidates. With just a handful of days, though, before voters narrow down the mammoth field to just two people, what's been the biggest surprise to you in this lengthy campaign? For me, it's been that no one ever dropped out. What about for you, Eric? It's been, I think the most interesting part to me is that uh, Scott Wagner is not polling anywhere near close to the top. I thought he would have been uh, up there within the top two or three people if you He's convivial. That. He has a great sense of humor and knowledge of the issues. Yeah, but he's been on the wrong side of a lot of issues over the past several years. And I think that that's affected him. And by not getting the Northland support, I think that was kind of a blow. The surprise well. for you, Stephen? My biggest surprise is the guy sitting next to me, the star's endorsement of uh, Alicia Kennedy and Phil Glenn. Um, <laughs> Not no shade, just yeah, saying. Right. Um, I think uh, Phil Glenn. Every time I said it, this just said that if he had the right eyes in front of him, a lot of people would like him. Me talking to people after some of the forums, mm -hmm. they said they liked him. Kennedy has some momentum right now. She sets herself apart by you know standing up saying she voted with her uh, constituents when it came to MLK and certain things with the airport. But I just don't know if she has enough steam to overcome some of the other candidates. Can't read. I think it's unbelievable to look at the money spent at this point. So far. We're talking the leading money candidates, you know, Steve Miller, 450000 I believe. You look at um, Jolie Justice, it's in the 600 range. And so I think it's amazing that at this point in a mayoral uh, race that we've seen this much money spent. Dave. My biggest surprise is that none of the candidates for strategic reasons or maybe just for policy reasons never suggested uh, unique approaches to problems that would help them stand out in the field. Typically when you have a field this big, one or two of the candidates will say, hey, I want to do something completely off the books on some issue, crime, potholes, whatever it is, and that would sort of steer the debate. Is that, that a fear really of happened. making a mistake? I think, it. well, it's a fear, Nick, of losing votes in a race in which two or three hundred votes could make a difference. This isn't going to be a huge turnout election and the uh, field is evenly spaced, and I think there was a fear that someone would say something wrong and cost themselves a few votes. We can't show all of last week's debate again, but if I'm most concerned about the amount of violence happening in Kansas City, which candidate is most likely to make a dent in the homicide rate, in your view, Eric? I think it would be Alicia Kennedy. I think she's got a very... She's a former uh, assistant prosecutor uh, in Jackson right. County. And she has a viable approach to dealing with the police department. Uh, with the contracts for them with all the money that they get. Did anybody to. else put a different answer down for that? Well, I think that Quentin Lucas is another person. He's really made criminal justice a uh, main focus of his campaign. And to me, those are two of the candidates who have really talked the most and made that a central aspect. If I'm still alarmed by how little has been done to patch up the potholes on my street, Stephen Dial, which candidate is most likely to get those holes fixed? Well, I think every candidate is going to tell you oh, that okay, they want right. to get them fixed. But yeah, um, nobody's a pro pot. <laughs> right. <laughs> but from talking with uh, candidates like Scott Taylor, who has always been talking about 
putting more funding, council passed in the budget, seven more million dollars. So everyone on council is gonna say, oh, I'll fix your potholes. But uh, just from talking to people, I mean, Jermaine uh, Reed has said, you know, I'm gonna be, make sure that the roads are smooth. So it's kind of a toss up. And isn't Steve Miller also the man with the road solutions? Indeed, he put on his helmet and gear and patched a pothole in a video. So he has made that a very big issue of his campaign. The bottom line is you can repair potholes, you can try and repave, but with the weather conditions that we have in Kansas City, they're still gonna happen. Dave, if I believe Kansas City has been far too generous in giving away tax breaks and incentives to developers, which candidate is gonna pull back the reins and say, no more. I think uh, uh, Quentin Lucas, who proposed the original limitation ordinance on some incentives, uh, has a bit of an advantage there, as does Alicia Kennedy, who has talked uh, aggressively about uh, ending incentives or changing incentives. And Phil Glenn has talked about it. He was on the TIF commission, kicked off because of some votes the mayor didn't like. So those three candidates at the top. I will say this. No matter who makes it past the uh, electorate next Tuesday, incentives in Kansas City will be under a microscope. You can't talk to any candidate who hasn't said, hey, we need to do something about reining in these uh, breaks for developers and using that money for other I'm purposes. assuming Clay Chastain would also say, what about me to that, that I would be against all these tax breaks. Yes, in fact, he told me he would dismantle the uh, TIF commission if he got into office and that he would tell them to go running away if they came to his door asking for incentives. A lot of our viewers have been concerned about the lack of affordable housing in this community. If I'm concerned about that, I want more options for affordable housing, who's the candidate I should be looking at? I think Jolie Justice has been talking about it as well as Alicia. I think that those two actually have something that might be a viable plan for affordable housing once you define what affordable housing is. Okay. I think also Quinton Lucas has chaired the housing committee and has also made that a big issue. Can, can I just throw in Phil Glenn who has worked on right. affordable housing issues in the private sector. I think he's made a pretty good case that he understands the need for that and by the way he said you've got to get the private sector involved. You cannot do this out of the city's checkbook. And there, just to piggyback with affordable housing and incentives because sometimes they may go hand in hand. I think uh, from having a conversation with some people this week uh, I think a lot of people a lot of the voters and people who live in Kansas City are saying downtown has been poured into and poured into now it's time to pour into the rest of the city and I think if be I've been happy with the way Sly James has led as mayor which candidate is most likely to follow in his shoes Eric <laughs> Jolly yes, yes that's, yeah. that's, okay. I think that's, that's a no but, right but I saw it but there was a poll done recently that said there was still 60 something approval rate for Mayor Sly James so it's not necessarily a bad thing for her no, I don't think so. She definitely has gotten a lot of support from that group that uh, also is very supportive of Sly James. It's not necessarily bad things. It's just a different way of maybe leading the city. The biggest thing that I heard from candidates when I asked them, how would you differ from Mayor Sly James? They all said they would take a more collaborative approach, which I think even Jolie Justice has said she's all about collaboration as well. Let's just be clear, though. Sly James is in her commercials. Mm -hmm. They share campaign consultants. Mm -hmm. She's endorsed the pre-K tax. None of the other mayoral candidates have. All of her chips are in the middle of the table on Sly James. If you believe the mayor isn't that powerful in the first place, and it's really just one of 13 votes on the city council, which candidate is most likely to convince others to go along with their ideas and get the seven votes necessary to actually pass anything? I think either of the Scots might be more collaborative, certainly. So Scott as, Wagner or Scott, Scott Taylor, because yeah, we, they've been there. Yes, they have been on the council, and they seem to be a bit more collaborative. The other side of that coin is, I think, Alicia Kennedy, who has got more than a little bit of sort of my way or the highway in her, very much like Sly James. Some people like that. Some people will find that difficult if she is elected to the uh, Now, office. of course, that council will be dramatically different for the next mayor, as voters are also picking new council members on Tuesday as well, with so many districts and candidates it's hard to zero in on all of them, but if there are any trends in those races that we need to be aware of, Eric? Yeah, the third district and district, yeah. uh, so large field of candidates. Uh, it's kind of like who's going to be the most popular rather than who's gonna, who knows the process and the system and who can get the job done. Anybody else have an answer to that yes, question? Um, Dave? We had a chance to meet with the candidates and all the contested uh, races, both at large and in district. We were astonished on the editorial board, Nick, and this is really important, at the quality of those candidates, the energy, the new approaches that they all brought to the table, almost without exception, 
and their youth. There is definitely a changeover, if you will, in Kansas City government from sort of the old guard. And I must say, particularly among African-American candidates, we noticed it a lot in the third district interviews that we did, that the idea of the old guard African-American political community is really slipping from the scene and younger people are saying it's our turn to come to the table. Kansas City should be encouraged by that. Now, voters also on Tuesday deciding whether to dip into their pocketbooks and hike up the sales tax to fund pre-K programs in Kansas City. In our recent debate, I was surprised to see that almost every single mayoral candidate was opposed to that. So is almost every local school superintendent. In fact, while you may get the impression everyone is opposed to it, that is not the case. The mayor may be its biggest backer, but I see the greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce supports it, the Civic Council, Hallmark, Children's Mercy Hospital. What is the main reason? And why people will want to vote yes for this on Tuesday, Ken? Uh, all of the research shows there's no debate that this is a good thing for kids, but where people disagree is the mechanism of how to actually do it. So it, it's shown that this puts kids in the position to succeed in school. I think that a lot of people in Kansas City want to see this happen, but how it happens is the disagreement. And the mayor has made this a sort of crime prevention strategy, too, that if we're really concerned about a lot of these systemic issues in Kansas City, investing in early childhood education is a major part of that solution, Eric. Absolutely. And he's very He's very correct in doing it. But the mayor has always been pro-education from turn to page when he first started and some of the other initiatives that he's had and having a relationship within the school district, <coughs> whether it's good or not. But he's always been engaged in that. So we'll, we'll see. And why, why would you want to vote no on that on Tuesday? Well, first of all, because it's a regressive tax. That means it hurts the poor. It's $30 million. But this is a sales tax, though, that mostly a lot of people who not even live in Kansas City would actually pay. There is some of that. That's always true for a sales tax. Roughly a third to a half of the sales tax is paid by people who don't live in Kansas City. That's a, a point for it. But it is still regressive in a community that is now approaching 10 cents on the dollar for sales taxes. $30 million a year is a lot of money. The management system is convoluted, to say the least. Who would supervise this money? A lot of the money in the early years doesn't go to subsidize pre-K. It goes for buildings and equipment and uh, marketing and studies and training and other things. So those are some reasons uh, that some people may oppose it. And it's about $60, apparently, for every Kansas Cityan that you will pay over the course of the year. Is that worth it? Do you have the chance to vote on that on Tuesday? Can, can I just say briefly, the school board is on the ballot on Tuesday as well. There are seven seats. Four of those seats, only one candidate, they're already in. A fifth seat is only right in. No one even signed up to run. Only two candidates are contesting their races. In an, in an election in Kansas City where every mayoral candidate has said, hey, I want to fix the schools, nobody wants to run for the school board. And that's another problem that we're going to confront when Tuesday is over. Why, why is it that that case, does that say that people are actually happy with the way the school district is running, that that's why they don't feel they have to be up in arms and running for office? To a degree, but to another degree in the district that he's talking about that nobody filed in, the community is disengaged with the process. Nobody probably even knew it was a filing because they were going through the redistricting and nobody knew that there was a seat that was eligible uh, for grabs. But on the other side, they are happy with the way the school district's going now. They're, we're close to getting accreditation, so people are pretty proud and happy of that. The mayor, by the way, also grabbing a little of the spotlight back for himself this week as he delivers his final State of the City address before invited guests at Rockhurst University. When I took office in May of 2011, I promised myself and anybody who would listen to me that I would leave this city in better shape than I found it. And I don't know whether people have loved every decision that I've made or not, I know that that couldn't possibly be true, that they've loved everything I've done because they have called me so often to let me know that. <laughs> but one thing that I will say is, is that I believe everybody will agree that we are better off now than we were then. What will Sly James be best remembered for? Will it be the streetcar laying the groundwork for a new look KCI airport, his push for early childhood education, or Cat Reed D, something completely different? I think probably the airport is going to be his biggest legacy project, even though he won't be in office as it's actually completed. He is responsible for really pushing this project forward. Stephen. I don't know if it, it seems like the, the most unanimous answer would be airport, but I think it's more of a an answer of just transforming Kansas City, continuing the momentum. I don't, like Kat said, he's not going to be in office when the airport finally opens. So some people might forget that he was 
pushing for it unless you're just really in tune with things. So I think it's just continuing the momentum of growing Kansas City and making it more visible on a national stage. Eric Wesson. I would say D, none of the above. I think he'll be remembered for being kind of outside the box, hard to kind of deal with like his way or no way, and he's got all the answers. And, and I think he'll be remembered more for that than most of the things that people think. I would say that um, uh, during his eight years, the city's faith in City Hall has improved dramatically. The idea that problems can be addressed uh, in a good way, and we've seen that at the ballot box time after time, Nick. We've, you know, renewal uh, of the earnings tax, approval of the uh, go bond package, approval of the eight cent uh, sales tax for the east side, the airport passed. I mean, that those are all very important endorsements of the direction of the city, and Sly James will be able to claim credit for that. Now, while there's lots of focus on Kansas City, Missouri, only 22 percent, or one in five metro area residents, live in KCMO, a higher percent lives in Johnson County, where Ayad Eilat was delivering his State of the County address this week before a large crowd in Olathe. Why were this, there so little coverage of his speech when more people live there? We couldn't even find any video <laughs> of this speech. What is going on? I think, and I, uh, I know some people may say, like you just said, a lot of viewers and a lot of people are living in the Johnson County area. It is growing. It is thriving. Do they have problems? Yes. Uh, as far as why isn't there as much coverage, I think signature issues like an airport, like pre-K education, like reducing crime aren't issues that are in Johnson County. While uh, a lot of people who live in Johnson County may work in the Kansas City area, I think uh, Johnson County is not going to get as many headlines um, as the big issues that are being tackled here. Dave, yeah. I think the only story I saw was from the Shawnee Mission Post about that speech. <laughs> yeah, we have more people living there than in Kansas City, Missouri. Right, but state of the city speeches and state of the county speeches are delivered and forgotten. They're, they're just not that important, either as statements of policy or as political documents. They're just not worth a lot of ink or a lot of airtime. There is, There are important developments in Johnson County, though, Nick, that are not necessarily at the county courthouse, but in city halls, in virtually every community, citizens feel energized about pushing back, about decisions that are being made on taxes, community centers, rezoning, all of those issues on the state, on the other side of the state line, and that does deserve some attention from all of us going forward. And Ed Eilert mentioning this week concern over senior services and also suicide, which has become a major trend issue in Johnson County that they're focusing on. While Johnson County has much of the economic clout in the metro, some of the biggest, shiniest projects, as Stephen Dahl mentioned, were on the Missouri side. That includes the airport. While you may remember we received complaints here at KCPT from viewers fed up of hearing about <laughs> KCI every single week, does the fact there was finally a groundbreaking on the project. Constitute a sufficient news excuse to bring it up again, or am I pushing my luck? <laughs> uh, this new terminal is the single largest economic development project in the past 50 years of Kansas City's history. Wheels up, Kansas City! <laughs> All right, Cat Reed, what does this mean for us in the short term? If you're heading out to catch a flight, are you going to be confronted with massive construction? Uh, is it going to even take you longer to get to the airport because of this? The aviation department says you really won't see any difference if you're flying out of BNC for another six to nine months. So that's once Terminal A comes down, they say that they're going to start changing some so of the... So this is going to take four to six months four to, to six even months. take down? Wow. Yeah, because they're doing it. Unfortunately, they can't just go and blow the whole thing up and have it come down in one big piece. They have to take it down section by section. And so, which the mayor actually started getting behind the wheel of the construction equipment, taking down a little section. But they said that in six to nine months, you'll start to see the traffic pattern change a little, a little bit around Terminal A. And that's when you'll start to notice um, some of the differences. But also, if you're just curious, you know, if you're not going to be impacted traffic necessarily, but if you want to see, you can drive by and see the pieces coming down. Now, while we see shiny shovels with dirt moving from one place to another there with Fake major dirt, officials. Fake dirt, by the Absolutely. But um, this is still not going to be a quick project. Is it still 2023 as the opening for the airport? Right, and we should just prepare your viewers, Nick. It may take longer than they say it will take now. The cost estimates may change over time. 
The political infighting over the airport will, will reduce from a boil to a simmer, but it will still be there, particularly on minority employment, women employment at the airport. All of those stories will continue, but it's much harder than ever now for the city to back away from what they've committed to. This airport is on the way. Now, as kcb 2 as viewers love history, we went through the archives this week and pulled out this gem from 50 years ago. Take a look at this original marketing video for KCI, promising the shortest walk to fly airport in the world. Three years of planning and research went into the design of KCI's unique terminals. The council decided that Kansas City needed an airport which would be convenient for the average air traveler. At KCI, the outgoing passenger will be able to drive directly to his gate. Then, after leaving his car, he can walk across the narrow terminal building to the ticket counter and passenger holding area and finally aboard his aircraft. In most cases, he will have walked less than 300 feet from his car to his aircraft. Will passengers in this new look KCI walk in most cases less than 300 feet from their car to their aircraft? Pretty camp? tough to do, but I will say I wish that that video we could have, you know, resurrected that maybe had some paper cutouts for this terminal. Uh, <laughs> they they did say though that convenience has been the number one thing they've heard in all of their design workshops with the community, and that is a priority for security reasons. You really just can't do an airport that way. Stephen, two things. My have times how times have changed. The video he says his all the time. You didn't hear her, but uh, two. Well, they, <laughs> women on. didn't fly back then. Right, right. And two, come on, people. This is not a fast food restaurant. It's an airport. Three hundred feet, five hundred feet. Just get to your plane in a nice. I understand the convenience part. But I think Kansas City residents have been spoiled by the community. He's talking about Atlanta. His yes, I am. Point out very quickly, they asked me to narrate that video back 50 <laughs> years ago. And, uh, I had other things to do. I was very busy, but I remember putting it together. Uh, actually not. Um, but you also noticed there was no security. There were no security right. concerns uh, in that right. footage. The idea of having a TSA or some private screener at the airport gate was unthought of back then, even though, by the way, hijacking was a problem in the, in the early 1970s. So the new design will be as convenient, I think, as possible in the environment in which we're in. Now, many people focused on local sports this week with opening day for the Royals and March Madness hitting Sprint Center this weekend. But it was also a March Madness of political town halls this week. Did you notice that? Every major local political leader seemed to be in town trying to pack out venues so they could be seen to be listening to voters. New Kansas Congresswoman Sharice Davids hosting her first town hall since being elected. Kat Reed, you were in Olathe for that. What did we learn that we didn't know already? about mm -hmm. Sharice Davis. She's taking a very cautious approach uh, during this early time in office. She did say she there are policies in the Green New Deal that she doesn't agree with, she's not on board with, so she would not commit to that. On the issue of Medicare for All or a single payer option, she said she hadn't read everything that she would need to read in terms of legislation and she would not commit on that issue. The new governor of Kansas also hosting a town hall this week, uh, this time at Johnson County Community College. It comes after a tough couple of weeks for her with the session coming to an end. There's been little action on any of Laura Kelly's major campaign priorities, and there's been missteps with appointments, including being forced to withdraw from consideration her Court of Appeals pick. That after it's revealed her nominee's social media feed was filled with vulgar language and slams on President Trump. Let's start with what Laura Kelly has actually done now three months in office. What has she actually accomplished? You were with her this week. Yes, I was talking with her and I think there was some momentum for Medicaid expansion, but I, I also think with her veto of that tax bill uh, that the Senate leadership will not allow uh, that Medicaid expansion to come up for a vote. It passed the House with a really good number, and I think she was happy about that, having some momentum. Also, the Senate passed a uh, education uh, bill that she supports, and now the House is kind of trying to change things. And so it's kind of a tale of two, you know, the House and Senate, uh, good things in one side and then opposition on the other side. So it's always, it seems like when she takes a step forward, it's a step back. Is she getting more pushback than she assumed when she took over Maybe. as governor? Maybe. I mean, I think there may have been some assumption that the Republicans would be more willing to deal than they've turned out to be, at least at this point in the session. The real question now, Nick, is whether there will be some grand bargain at the end of April, which includes everything, Medicaid, tax cuts, school finance, uh, other things that Republicans want, or 
if there will be sort of stalemate, 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 and then they'll do the bare minimum, maybe pass the school bill, go back to court. That remains up in the air um, and won't be decided probably until the next couple of weeks are passed. Really quick, one interesting thing that is making its way through the Kansas legislature that I know Governor Kelly will probably support if it gets to our desk, uh, there is a bill uh, that just passed the House that would allow parents with sick children or just in individuals to go to Colorado, get low THC oil, and legally bring it back and administer it to their children. I think if that passes, the legislature, Democrats will quickly say, then why not just pass medical marijuana in Kansas? Because that's basically what it is. And so be on the lookout for that. I mentioned there had been a lot of high-profile political town halls in our metro. Even national players now getting in on the act. Did you see that Fox News will be here on Thursday for a national televised town hall with the former head of Starbucks, Howard Schultz, who is toying with an independent run for president. Fox News is based in New York. Howard Schultz lives in Seattle. Why did they decide to host a big event like that here? I have no idea, except maybe they drank too much coffee and they were so <laughs> energized by the idea of comes. Maybe you guys understand. Met in the middle, right? I think it it's may just be right. I'm assuming it's they're the not idea. going to serve um, roastery coffee. Oh. Uh, yeah. I assume oh, that. Well, we focused a lot on the mayor's race, KCI, all manner of big political questions. Let's get our priorities right, though, this week. After decades of sacrifice, Kansans starting on Monday will finally be able to walk into their local grocery store and buy full strength beer. Yes. While Monday is April Fool's Day, this is not an April Fool's joke. It's official. It may sound trivial, but this is a sweeping change for Kansas. They haven't been able to do this, Eric. Absolutely, and I know the, the breweries are going to be <laughs> thrilled to death that they're going to finally get off of that 3-2 beer. This is one of the lost <laughs> states in the nation to do this. Well, it's been a, a, a really aggressive <laughs> fight in Topeka for many years because the liquor stores don't like it at all. They want to be able to sell full strength or 5% beer and then the 3-2 beer in grocery stores, but the stores finally want to. You have to be 21, though, still to buy that beer. Not so for concealed weapons in Kansas. I noticed the Kansas House also passing this week a bill that would reduce the uh, concealed weapons ability to 18 years old instead of 21. That is correct. And several other states like Alabama and Montana uh, have it 18 years old. Uh, I believe Missouri is 18 years old if you're in the military, but yes, a big talker. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news review from 41 Action News, Kat Reed, and from the call, Eric Wesson, 41 Action News reporter Stephen Dial, and from your star, Dave Helling, I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.